thank you so much um, for turning up after lunch. It's uh, always great to see so many people after they've had their lunch break, so thanks very much for coming back. Um, I wanted to start the session. It's attack awareness, intelligence sharing. Um, my name's Leonie Lewis, and I'm the senior intelligence um, TISAC manager. Um, I'm going to be going through um, a panel session. We've got um, a keynote um, session as well as part of this. And um, I'm really looking forward to um, really discussing the ways in which our sectors can work um, together in sharing information and why that's really important. I think from my perspective, I'd like to get to know you a little bit more. Um, and I just wanted some hands raised. Who actually knows what ISAC stands for? Okay, that's great. Okay, so you're gonna learn a lot in this session. <laughs> Um, and also, are you aware of um, your organization being part of an ISAC? I guess that's something that would be really useful to know. If you know that, put your hands up. Okay. All right. This session's definitely for you. Um, okay. So, um, what I wanted to let you know was a little bit more about my background, just so that you can understand my journey really into the ISAC and, and um, sharing world. And um, I spent most of my career traveling around with my husband who's in the army and working in different um, police forces in intelligence and crime roles. Um, most notably, and what really got me into the cyber side of things was with the City of London Police and I work with their cyber protect team. And this links with the regional organized crime units throughout the UK. I then jumped ship from, from the public sector, which was quite difficult. Um, but actually, I wanted to um, go out into the world of the private sector and, and really start to look at um, how we can utilize and work together in terms of public and private. Um, and as part of that, I worked for a global satellite company as their strategic cyber threat intelligence lead. Um, within that, I had a role that was very much about looking at how we shared with external entities, um, global government, law enforcement, and also other ISAT communities. And actually, within that, I have many use cases where being part of an ISAC was incredibly useful um, and um, in terms of our cyber security posture. I've now been part of the GSMA as um, the TI SAT manager since December 2019. And um, our telecommunication ISAC that I head up has been going really since just about six months before I started. So we are in many, um, in the ISAT world, I guess we're sort of toddler stage, but we've got lots to offer. And um, what you'll find from the panel is there's different ISACs with different maturity levels and, and lots of useful information to bring um, for you to find out about. So the whole session objectives, really, you're going to find out what an ISAC is. And I've actually put down information sharing and analysis center, so I answered one of those questions for you. Um, why ISACs and other trusted sharing groups are vital for the sectors they serve, and the fact that you've come here and you're interested is really encouraging for us. Um, there are challenges to sharing, and why we also need to look at that cross-sector collaboration. And then Within that, um, we're going to look at our different threat landscapes where they sort of convene and where we've got unique challenges within them. And then the whole point of this is really to build a stronger security stance against cyber threats and risks. So we're going to start off this session with our keynote. Um, this is Anna Potapova, and she's head of Global Strategic Partnerships at AB Handshake. And Anna's going to provide invaluable insights into the world of fraud, 
and shedding light in the current vulnerabilities that enterprises must address to prevent substantial revenue losses and protect their customers and reputation effectively. And as part of the theme of the attack awareness intelligence sharing session, Anna is going to present compelling evidence showcasing the repeated use of specific numbers to launch attacks on various indus industry verticals. She's also going to highlight the, the importance of collaboration where communities exchange information about malicious actors and mobile numbers that require temporary blocking. So AB Handshake are one of our TAI SAC members and they provide valuable high-risk numbers into our fraud intelligence service platform. And now I'm going to hand over to Anna. Unfortunately, she can't be with us, so we're going to do this virtually. Welcome, Anna. Hi, hello, everyone. Um, uh, Liani, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Anna. I represent AB Handshake Company. We are a global provider of fraud prevention services. And of course, thank you very much to the audience for joining this session. Thank you very much for Jason May for providing this wonderful opportunity to discuss the work that we have been doing together with the TISAC throughout uh, 2023. And yes, with the view of this today, I will be sharing some of the recent discoveries made by AB Handshake. As Leoni mentioned, we will be looking into the specific fraudulent numbers that target different industry verticals and what impact this voice and SMS fraud has on those verticals. And of course, most importantly, how different sectors can work together in order to enhance their security strategy. And uh, to begin with, um, of course, there is no doubt that fraud is shifting its focus from individual users towards industry verticals. One of the key factors contributing to this change is, of course, that initially fraud attacks were very straightforward and mechanisms were very simple, targeting individual subscribers. However, mobile operators had to be implemented advanced surveillance measures, they enhance their fraud prevention mechanisms to protect their end users. Uh, and in the light of these developments, uh, fraudulent actors had to um, identify some of the blind spots left in the security strategy of mobile operators, and they did it. They started abusing uh, the business traffic. So the question is why industry verticals are becoming primary victim of telecom fraud. Of course, despite the fact that we see that the overall number of fraudulent attack is decreasing, especially comparing to 10 years ago, the overall impact, uh, especially the financial damage is massive. Uh, so the question is why? A few factors contributing to enterprises being the primary victim of fraud is that businesses are still generating immense volume of SMS and traditional voice calls. In many cases, this traffic is not charged, is not built in real time, and this impedes the real time detection uh, of this fraud on the side of the enterprises. And at the same time, uh, not every enterprise has a dedicated anti fraud team or has any sufficient fraud control tools in place. And last but not least, what we saw is that different industry verticals, they exist in isolation and there is little or no platform at all for the data exchange and knowledge sharing about the ongoing fraudulent activity and about the numbers that are identified in those fraudulent attacks. So considering everything that I mentioned above, uh, AB Handshake, yes, and it also initially was focusing on protecting mobile uh, operators and transit carriers only. But with the recent trends, we are shifting our focus towards protecting industry verticals. We are cooperating with different industry members, uh, especially JSMA, uh, some others like ITU, SAPSI, and RAG, 
we highlight the importance of protecting business traffic and we underline the importance of the knowledge sharing between industry members. And before we jump into the main part of the presentation, I would like to give a very brief overview of how actually fraud schemes are functioning, what are the mechanisms behind that. And of uh, course, there is great variety of fraud scenarios, but uh, today I will be describing three uh, fraud types that are very specific to industry verticals. So the first fraud type is Wangari 2.0. This is a voice fraud. In this scenario, internet bots, they go uh, into online contact forms on the website and they introduce premium rate numbers to make a, for example, contact center employees to call back to those numbers or, for example, make automated services of an enterprise to call back to this number. We see that a lot of those calls are going to the country prefixes of Africa or the number prefixes of Asia Pacific region. The second fraud type, um, I guess it doesn't require any specific introduction, PBX hacking, it's been around for ages. Uh, the scheme is pretty simple. A PBX, either traditional or IP based PBX is hacked. Uh, fraudulent actors generate traffic uh, from this PBX or the route calls uh, uh, via this PBX. I guess what's important to mention here is that if you look uh, on the diagram on the slide, uh, you can see that we still detect that a lot of those attacks are happening on Saturday and Sunday when the corporate systems have little or no surveillance at all. And the last fraud type that I will be describing today is SMS AIT, SMS uh, Artificial Inflation of Traffic. It's been a buzzword in 2023. So the workflow is very similar to Wangari 2.0, which I described earlier. So the internet bots, they create fake accounts uh, and they trigger one time password, the auth authentication SMS to mobile numbers. Uh, and fraudulent uh, actors are trying to intercept this inflated SMS before they reach uh, the final number. And uh, of course, from all those three fraud types, Hungary 2.0, PBX hacking, and SMS AIT, industry verticals uh, suffer from uh, financial losses, and the financial losses are immense. Again, if we're talking about SMS AIT, we see an increase in this fraud type. Um, here on the screen, you can see an uh, example from a specific international aggregator. So this is a sample of traffic, not all the traffic that is coming from this enterprises. What I can say from the experience of AB Handshake, we observe that on average, 10% of all outgoing international SMS from an enterprise are generated. They uh, refer to SMS AIT. Um, but again, if we, there are some specific cases, depending on the destination, depending on the aggregator that you might work with, we see that in some cases, as you can see on the screen, it may reach up to 80%, 90 or even 100% on specific international traffic samples. So because AB Handshake, this global visibility of this traffic, um, we often get questions, how often do we identify the same number being involved in multiple fraudulent attacks? What is the pattern behind this? And this is a very good question. So we decided to conduct a research. We, uh, we um, analyzed almost 20,000 attacks. And here I would like to bring your attention to the fact that one attack does not equal one single call. Uh, if the attack is not blocked in real time, inside one attack there can be several thousands of fraudulent calls, so this number is pretty scary. And uh, what we found out in this research, yes, in fact, one number in 62, 62.5% of cases is responsible for one attack. But again, despite the fact that we are working with over 100 entities worldwide, we're still not working with everybody. And the same number can be identified in, in the attack that we simply do not see, so this number can be decreased. But the important conclusion of this research was that in 36, 37% of cases, 
one attack is actually responsible for uh, one number is actually responsible for multiple attacks from two to 20 or even higher. So I decided to give you uh, two case studies from this research. Uh, let's look at the case study number two. So there was a number range belonging to Zimbabwe and throughout three months, it targeted, it, it uh, was identified in 34 attacks targeting different industry verticals. So in one day, as you can see on the graph on the right, December 29, uh, this number was responsible for uh, four different attacks targeting different enterprises and different industry verticals. Again, I remind you that four attacks can be several thousands of fraudulent calls. Um, so the question is, what is the specific pattern behind, behind the voice attacks, for example? I decided to provide you with a sample of our research. Uh, so I hope you can see it on the screen. Um, I highlighted some of the examples in red. So in the right column, you can see the numbers or the number range that uh, was identified in the attack. So I bring your attention to the first example in red. You can see that the same number was responsible for the attack targeting two different industry verticals, uh, governmental and financial. But what is even more interesting, if we look at the left column on the timestamp, all the examples in black above uh, the difference in the attacks uh, is very insignificant from one minute to less than one hour. In this case, the difference in attack was almost one day, meaning that if we, if different industry verticals had a possibility, had a opportunity to share these numbers and these number ranges, we could act more proactively towards protecting the industry. The same applies to the last example in red. Again, the same number range responsible for targeting two different industry verticals and the difference, uh, the time difference in attack was almost two days. Um, the, same, um, the same patterns apply to the SMS AIT. Um, here, I would like to bring your attention to the last example in red. You can see on the right, again, the, the same number in this case, it was targeting three different verticals, information technology, entertainment, and retail. And the time difference in attack was one month from uh, June 1st till June 30th. Uh, so it gives us a lot of time as the industry to add this number to our hot list, to uh, pay more attention to the traffic going towards this numbers and number ranges. And to conclude my presentation, I decided to share with you some of the recent cases that caught my attention the most. Uh, the first case study is about SMS AIT. So we detected an SMS AIT attack uh, coming from two different enterprises belonging to two different industry verticals, financial and entertainment. The attacks um, that were targeting those enterprises were going to the number range belonging to Kuwait. So what we discovered was that 58% of SMS inside these attacks were actually successfully delivered to real subscribers. You will ask me what, what, what's bad about this. The, the bad thing about this is that those real subscribers, they did not use the service. They did not request for this authentication SMS, but they received it from an enterprise. And of course it looked fraudulent. And for, uh, of course, the damages a lot the enterprise who was the victim of this attack. It damages a lot the reputation of the mobile operator whose services the users are utilizing. And of course, uh, those verticals, those enterprises had to pay for those generated SMS. So it posed the uh, great financial damage for them. And the last case is about SMS phishing. I didn't introduce it in the beginning as a fraud type, but I guess everybody is familiar. Everybody received similar kind of SMS um, in their life. So throughout 2023, we, we discovered several attacks. They involved the same number belonging to Malaysia. There was uh, an SMS coming from Malaysian number to the US users. Uh, and the sender impersonated delivery service. Interestingly enough, later on, we discovered an SMS coming from the same Malaysian number to users in Italy, 
And then this time, this time uh, the sender impersonated healthcare services. And later, uh, there was an SMS again from the same Malaysian number going to uh, users in Singapore. And then this time, they were pretending to be insurance company. Uh, of course, all the SMS contained phishing link, uh, trying to persuade users to click on that and leave their personal data. And I'll be honest with you, when I received this SMS, uh, for me, it didn't look any convincing, but there are other users, there are other subscribers that continue clicking uh, on this link inside this SMS. They continue losing their uh, data to fraudsters. And um, we understand that from so many complaints that mobile operators are still receiving about those SMS, we're still seeing immense volumes of SMS phishing and SMS on the global market. So that means that people are continually clicking on those SMS. So um, I guess the conclusion that we can drive from all those presentations is that in knowledge sharing and identifying those numbers responsible for damaging yeah, the brand image responsible for damaging your revenues, um, very important. And before I pass it to Liani and the great speakers of today's panel, I would like to ask you a couple of questions that I encourage you to think about and share your opinion later on. So is there a way that different industry verticals can share these numbers uh, with themselves to, to proactively react to those attacks? Um, who can contribute to this database? Who will coordinate this database? Who can have access to this database? There are a lot of open questions that we need to solve. And again, uh, even more importantly, is there a way to share this information in real time? Uh, for example, based on the API, so we can always stay tuned uh, for the ongoing fraudulent activity. Um, I hope that you find this insights useful, especially before the upcoming panel session. Um, again, if you have good answers, any answers for the questions that was on the previous slide, please feel free to contact me or Leon if you have any questions. Again, I'm more than open to talk to you offline after this event. Um, Leonie, thank you very much. Um, I think we are out of time. Okay, thanks so much, Anna. That was absolutely insightful. I hope everybody agrees with me on that. Um, and it really enforces the idea of the power of collaborative sharing. Um, as you saw, Anna's contact details were on screen, but if you didn't catch them, you can contact me and, and the details will be at the end um, for all our panelists as well. Um, before I move on, we had a clock at the back. Justin, are you able to get that back up and running so that I took my, uh, my watch off in case it started talking to me? Um, <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to the next part of this session. Um, and the way this is going to work is a little bit different. Um, I'm going to give my panelists five minutes to introduce the ISAC or sharing community that they're involved with, and also a brief overview of the threat landscape that relates to their sector. And I understand that that is a challenge, which is why I need the, the clock. Um, so it's a bit like speed dating. We're going to hand over um, and hopefully um, we'll get into a discussion about all the things that have been um, talked about at length from our panelists at the beginning. So just to kick things off, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about telecommunication ISAC, as you know, that I head up. Um, we currently provide over 400 cyber and fraud specialists an opportunity, and these are from 149 telecom-related organizations that are GSMA members, and they have a trusted and transparent environment to share relevant, timely, and actionable information on cyber threats and risks. We also provide opportunity, really, for sharing the best practice and mitigation techniques, because it's not just about sharing data. It's about sharing um, expertise, best practice, things that are working well, things that aren't working well. And I just wanted to pull out a few of the benefits, really, that our memberships are already um, having as part of being in the telecommunication ISAC. And so one of the first things to note is this is global. 
And so we're able and have had a real life case where we could actually track a campaign that went around the world. Um, and within that, um, as we started to stop um, and mitigate infection, really reduce the levels of infection, the threat actors had to get more and more sophisticated and um, were able, we were able to talk about these um, different variants and methodologies in real time. So if in one part of the world they hadn't experienced it yet, they already had a flow of information, best practice in terms of how their customers, um, they could approach their customer with some of the information and reports that were being already used by operators to try and um, help them understand the situation and how they could um, stop from getting infected. Um, I think also in terms of the data side, the more data that's input into the system, the more we can um, correlate it and, and identify connected events like you've seen in the keynote. Um, and then we can identify those priority indicators of compromise from um, the incidents and the attacks that are happening. Again, I spoke about the infection rate reduction. And then we've got an opportunity here because a lot of um, information that we share in telecommunication, ISAC, is very specific. So signaling attack information. And um, we have ways now, and we're developing templates to actually share that information so it's easier to analyze. So I just wanted to quickly go through um, the way in which we process and the idea really with ISACs and sharing communities follows an intelligence workflow pattern. Um, so the first question is, and, and I'm sure you'll be thinking about this, what type of things are, are keeping your bosses and you know, the top level um, awake at night, what are those priority intelligence requirements that your ISAC needs to gather and any gaps um, so that we can try and get collection of information, which is the next point. Where does that collection come from? Um, is it from external feeds? Or as in telecommunication ISAC, we're wanting more unique data. There's lots of opportunity for open source information and intelligence sharing. And that's all well and good because it adds context and validation potentially. But um, we really want our members to share things that are very specifically being um, seen on their networks, for example. And then in terms of the analysis side, um, it's how, how, how are we looking at this analysis? What's the purpose of it? Do we need to get an alert out very quickly? Is this spreading very quickly, this situation? Or is it um, something in more slower time that we just need to provide a bit more context and educate our members um, about something that could potentially happen? Um, in terms of the production, so this is where we're trying to cover a lot of bases. Um, what is the maturity of our organizations um, that we serve? Um, and something that really struck me this morning in the keynote from Vodafone was that 20 million organizations lack access to a cybersecurity expert. Well, if you join an ISAC, you have the potential to have many, many um, cybersecurity and fraud access um, um, expertise on hand. So that's definitely something to think about. So from that production side, in terms of do we push it out as a, um, a webinar? Do we get people in an event like this, for example? And how often do we do it without overloading um, our members? And then in the dissemination side, we've got a, a platform for fraud um, number sharing, as you've already seen. We've also got a chat forum for real-time sharing. Um, and we've also got a threat intelligence platform as well. And then I think crucial to all of this is stakeholder feedback. And it's central to everything that we do. There's no point in doing something if it doesn't actually have relevance um, and is not going to help the membership and therefore the industry. So at all stages within that, we're asking for feedback. 
And then just a bit of a shameless plug um, in terms of our threat landscape. Um, we produce a mobile telecommunication security landscape report, and this comes out every year around February time. And this is based on real-world insight from Wild and from member shares, of course, preser preserving their anon anonymity. I knew I shouldn't have used that word. Um, and the security themes in it that the report covers uh, infiltration, so that's where someone's trying to obtain unauthorized access to a system or data access. We've got access exploitation using that unauthorized access for account access, privilege escalation or lateral movement, and then availability compromise, such as denial of service attacks. And then across the following ta attack types, as you can see, the internet complexity of the mobile threat landscape means there are threats specific to mobile networks, as I discussed earlier in terms of our signaling, um, but also the wider sort of physical attacks cables, masts, um, and then, of course, corporate systems. And as such, there is a wider applicability of threats to many other sectors. So because of this, we need a mutual security resilience across the sectors, and really this is what our session is about. So with that said, I'm going to um, welcome Lucy Usher from the Financial Services ISAC to speak to us first. So um, I'm going to move around a bit because I'm a mover and a groover um, and so I've only got five minutes but I've got 37 slides so I'm going to speak really quickly uh, and of course I don't have 37 slides but I do speak quickly so if I speak too quickly just wave your hand and I'll try and slow down. So my name is Lucy Usher, I'm the Intelligence Officer for the EMEA region at FS Isaac, the Financial Sector, Finance Sector's Information Sharing Analysis Centre. Thank you for having that up earlier, Leona. It is a mouthful. <laughs> right, so let's move on. So who are FS Isaac? So back in around 1998, uh, following uh, a presidential directive, um, financial institutions in the US had to be part of a member organization um, to share information following some kind of incident that happened and the ISACs were born and the finance sector was very very successful so then they had real estate oil and gas aviation and and here we are some 23 years later and ISACs are a real thing and I implore you if you are not part of an ISAC or a community of sharing please do so, please consider it, it's really useful. So over at FS Isaac, we've got the three strands. We have uh, intelligence, security, and resilience. And we're gonna speak a little bit later on the panel with regards to resiliency at FS Isaac. We run tabletop exercises, hands-on exercises, know your playbooks. If you don't have a playbook for that incident, please speak with somebody about getting a playbook. Because if you need to reach for that playbook and you don't have one, things are gonna get really quick and and a bit tasty if you are dealing with an incident, so please do consider having an incident uh, uh, response playbook. So I'm gonna speak a little bit more about the intelligence side of things, uh, as that's where I work at FS Isaac. So part of that, how do we get our members to share and, and be part of a discussion? The owner's already mentioned about TLP. At FS Isaac, we have the TLP guide, and there's lots of information that you can find on, on the uh, traffic light protocols. By default, our members share with us at Amber, which means it can only be shared within the membership. And that builds that trust. That means that our members can discuss threats, intelligence they can share with us. We can anonymize it to help build that trust. But also, we've got a platform called Connect, which means that our members can have that discussion, that lifetime discussion. If there's a particular threat, and on the next slide, I've got the cyber threat landscape, which may or may not be sort of familiar to some of you. And it's useful to have that community open for discussion in a closed environment. And that's where we find that really, really works well because if there is an incident, or it might even just be in the daily churn, is this unusual, is this something I need to be concerned about, let me just log on, or log into whichever community sharing um, uh, community that you're part of, just to get that sanity check. Should my hair be on fire about this? Is the community talking about this? No, they're not, well that's good. Or, hang on a minute, what are they talking about and why am I not talking about that? So let's move on to the next slide because I don't want to go too much. So this here, 
looked bigger on the screen when I did it, so apologies for the squintingness of that, but I'll break it down. So at FSI, Zach, we have, like I say, sort of different regions. We've got the Americas, we've got uh, APAC and EMEA, which is where I'm going to sort of be talking from. And we have cyber threat levels. And it's important to note at FSI, Zach, I don't set the EMEA cyber threat level. We have an EMEA threat intelligence committee made up of members reflecting the membership. The members determine the cyber threat level. And it's been a bit of an interesting time. It certainly is interesting anyway, but over the last few weeks, things have kind of been a little bit busier as well. We found that having a cyber threat level for our members, determined by members, is a really useful thing for our members to have. It's always available. It gets updated routinely every two weeks. The, uh, the EMEA Threat Intelligence Committee will vote on it. They'll convene. They'll discuss the threats. Actually, no, it needs to remain at guarded at this time. There's definitions for elevated and high. And we'll vote, we'll ask our members to vote on various calls as well, making sure that we reflect the region. Now, there's no point me or FSIs at just having, oh, it's at green. We need to have some considerations. Well, why is it at green? What's going on at the moment? And I've broken it down. Some vulnerabilities. I thought I spotted a spelling mistake then, but I didn't. <laughs> So currently, we've got the progress uh, move it transfer zero day. This has been going on probably for about four or five weeks. Feels like years, but it hasn't. And the fallout of that, that there were already threat actors exploiting that vulnerability. And they've been posting to their uh, ransom, whereas a service leak site, that there are victims of that. And some of those victims may or may not have been in the finance sector. And that is a concern. So that's certainly been built into the uh, considerations. Hacktivist activity. We know that if we see um, a particular country coming out for support in, for Ukraine, then we'll get pro-Russian hacktivists then targeting that country, targeting a different sort of wide range of sectors, or it, it's usually aviation, finance, government, healthcare, transport. But it's always nice for our members to say, well, actually, let me go online. Let me speak with the community. Is that, should I be concerned about that? Well, yeah, you should be considering it. But actually, maybe the risk of it is a lot lower than you think. And maybe they're just masters of getting in the news. We've also got uh, ransomware operators targeting financial institutions via the supply chain risk. It may well be that your organization is so well protected, well done you, but your supply chain could be the vulnerability. And that is certainly a concern. And there we can see on the left-hand side, that we've got this, that when we do it for each region, and we love it when our members share with us because we want to truly reflect what is being reported in. I've listed, I think, somewhere, some malware. That shouldn't be too, uh, I might be getting nodded at from the only in a minute. I'm kind of wandering <laughs> on, sorry. Some malware, and we see these, and uh, uh, this, that's nothing new. We see the same type of malware churning over. One might drop off, but they're all trying to do the same thing, get into your networks. And with that, I'm going to move on. Sorry, Leone. No, no, lovely. If, um, Catherine's going to come up to the stage from um, European Rail, ISAC. Is it not? Sorry. Well, thank you, Catherine. OK. What have you done to the clicker? <laughs> Sabotage. OK. Click is not working. It's a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's working. Yay. Okay. So thank you, Leonie, for having me today to talk about ARISAC. So ARISAC stands for European Rail um, Information Sharing. Uh, center. We started our activities in 2019, so that's not a long time, but still a while ago, and we are still not very mature. So um, we've got actually 14 country members uh, joining the association. So we we have big players, such as, for instance, Great Britain, France. We also have small players, such as Belgium, Luxembourg. Some countries are very mature, other countries are less mature. I'm not going to tell you who's mature, who's not, but it's quite important to know that we have different levels within the R Isaac. What's important to understand also is each country has usually two different types of organizations, if they're quite separate, infrastructure manager or railway undertaking. So that means that each country brings two people around the table. 
also important to know that we belong to the public sector, so it's quite important to know when we, it comes to different things that we'll be talking about later, but we also have private um, railway undertaking that tries to, to join um, Isaac and also freight um, company that wants to join Isaac, so it's quite interesting. We don't have any chair, we have only co-chair, so we have four of them actually, and I'm talking on behalf of Infobel, which is actually the Belgian infrastructure manager of Belgium. Uh, Belgium. So what do we do? We talk, we share information, we, we do anything that could help us to improve our resilience, cyber resilience. And how do we do that? We bring experts together, and they make them talk. It's not easy because they have all the expertise, they all have their own domain. You know, some on them only knows, you know, cybersecurity, other people only know, you know, business, but they have to talk together. They can talk about incident, we don't have that many, so we mainly talk about threat, vulnerability, risks, and we share a lot. We try also to learn from our mistakes or bad lessons, and we try to get best practice. We have organized our ecosystem with a CISO forum that is quite recent, that gives the strategic um, well, direction. Then we have the RISAC, and we also have the working hands that helps us to deal with the market, because you know that the market is very fruitful. They give us lots of things to, to analyze, to evaluate. So when it comes to how to implement um, diff um, different solution, we get to them. Threat landscape, it's quite important to understand that it's something, it's oversimplified for the sake of my speech, of course, but we, we had to discuss a lot, well, almost a year, just to decide that this is going to be our threat landscape. So that means we are going to focus, each of us, on that sort of things. So mainly on hacktivists, not because they are doing a lot of harm, but just because they are bringing us into the light and we like to stay in the shadow. Also, we tend to connect, you know, inside with activists for many, many reasons. So we said, we decided we are going to focus ourselves, energy and money on that sort of things. If you go to the target, then we, we have that IT domain, which is no big challenge, no big surprise for you. Always, always target. Doesn't mean that it is successful, but, you know, we are sort of stressed in that uh, sense of... Um, um, term and OT that's quite new is also being challenged. You know, we used to feel very safe because we had all those very old equipments, you know, speaking very fancy uh, protocol that nobody wants to challenge, but today is changing. We heard this morning that 5G is going to bring a lot of challenge. I can confirm that. So, this is more or less what I had to tell you today. I'm going to welcome Hannah, Symes, BT Protect, and very keen. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Hi. Yeah, so just do a quick introduction. So yeah, my name is Hannah Sines. Um, I work for Protect BT, so I don't actually work for an ISAC, but I'm a working group member of ETIS, who I'm here to represent today. Um, so as a CTR manager in BT, we are involved in multiple different ISACs. Um, so not just the uh, telecom sharing ISACs, but we're also members of some of the financial services ISACs as well. Unfortunately, um, not the rail, rail ISAC yet, but um, we mainly as we are a conduit of, of the threats as an ISP, internet service provider of internet traffic. Um, you know, uh, essentially, we are the conduit by which threat actors carry out their attacks. Um, so yes, I just wanted to sort of go a bit into my background. So I come from an intelligence community background. I was previously, before coming into BT and part of becoming part of the telco arena, I actually worked in a joint forces cyber group as part of a military and government um, UK um, and Five Eyes intelligence community. Um, and as part of my experience during that, obviously uh, saw how telco infrastructure was um, essentially utilized by uh, nation state adversaries um, in order to carry out their attacks and wanted to come and work in the telco sector primarily um, to help try and, um, you know, to mitigate some of those effects um, and be, be part of that intelligence sharing community on the, on the commercial side. So yeah, so um, for the past year or so, um, BT has become involved in ETIS, which is uh, the European Telco Information Sharing Group. Um, and it, which is a national European standards body uh, for security and intelligence. Um, and then 
I've now become, uh, it's, a, it's a grand title, the vice chair. I'm actually one of the co-team co for the CERTSOC working group. And this is more of the tactical side um, of threat intelligence sharing. So like I said, so what is ETIS? Um, so it's a non-profit knowledge sharing platform for all of the European uh, telecommunica telecommunications industry. Um, so similar in a way to Leone explaining about TISAC. Um, however, it's a, it's a bit more, it's a smaller um, ISAC and it's more focused obviously on Europe. Um, so it's essentially the ETIS was funded, founded in 1991 um, and primarily started as a standards body um, looking at uh, all sorts of global standards on uh, telco security. And then latterly in the last couple of years, um, the CERTSOC working group and various other working groups as well, such as the anti-abuse anti telco network and information security working groups have all sprung up as, as different areas of the overall organization. We've now got more than 30 um, uh, European telcos, including a couple from uh, the UK, and this represents 21 countries within, within Europe. Um, so, like I said, we've got multiple different working groups and I'm part of the, the CERTSOC one. So, um, the, the CERTSOC telco network, um, we have bi-weekly intelligence sharing calls. Um, we also have twice a year face-to-face -face conferences as well to talk about different um, threat and tell um, either either attacks or other sort of strategic um, areas of, of, of development um, of security standards, for example. So last year was the first time we'd had a face-to-face -face conference um, since the pandemic, and this was actually hosted by Pete BT uh, for the rest of um, ETIS uh, last September. Um, and as a result of that, as we'll get on to talk, um, fairly shortly about the benefits of actually knowing your knowing your customers as it were knowing who you're talking to and and building those trusted relationships and and actually doing that has actually um, helped us a lot with being able to share timely actionable intelligence um, off the back of actually knowing who you're talking to um, yep yeah, so that's everything from my side um, and I'll pass over Absolutely. thank Thanks, you Anna. thank you and let me just welcome, last but not least, Lynn from the Cyber Defence Alliance. And I knew this was a challenge. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks, Leonie. Thanks for uh, letting us speak today. Yeah, I'm from the Cyber Defence Alliance. Uh, slightly different from the other Isaacs that are here today. We are more of a smaller sharing community uh, organisation. Uh, my, my job at Cyber Defence Alliance is Cyber Crime Operations Lead. I really look at those uh, ideas on how to improve what we do for prevention, detection and mitigation of cyber crime. A uh, bit of my background, I'm 20 years uh, doing intelligence and investigations in law enforcement primarily and then went into um, telco for a couple of years before going to CDA for the last four years. Um, a little bit about the Cyber Defence Alliance, probably no one's heard of us, we're very small. As I say, there's only 13 members, uh, we're a not-for-profit agency. Um, and we basically work together and as like an Isaac does sharing intelligence, but just on a much smaller scale. Um, I've put our strategy down here just to give you an idea of what we do, but I won't go into any detail, just to say that the different areas we work in are proactive networks of defence, so your normal cyber threat intelligence. Uh, we do instant response and support, so we have the 24-7 um, sort of instant uh, call number effectively for not only ourselves at CDA but also for the FSCCC so if there's anything that anyone's really um, worried about that they want a collaboration call on we will do that. Uh, we have a pillar which is quite different to some of the Isaacs where we're actually working to try and use some of the intelligence that we have uh, for attribution arrest and disruption so working with the intel from CDA as well as our member banks to put in uh, intelligence development to law enforcement who can then do something about trying to get to the criminals behind some of these frauds and other cyber crime that we see. And pillar four is the strategic assessment and innovation. Uh, like I said earlier, we do quite a lot to try and improve what we do already, trying to work out whether it's something extra we can do in technology or something else we can do to just improve the way we're working. Um, 
our threat landscape, uh, we've already had Lucy up talking about the financial sector threat landscape. This is obviously going to be very similar because we're in the same sector. But what I did think when I was looking at this was actually most of the things that we're most concerned about are not just uh, the financial sector threat landscape, it's everyone's threat landscape. The one that I've pointed out which is slightly different is uh, we've got a real focus on payment systems, making sure that um, things like the current geopolitical issues, sanctions with Russia, et cetera, et cetera, aren't going to lead to some sort of um, denial of service that may well impact um, payment systems. And on the cyber crime side, obviously, banks have money, so cyber criminals are always going to be looking at uh, that as a way to try and try and make some, some money quick. Um, in terms of the threat landscape, general points, I think the ones that, I'm not going to pick out all of these, but vulnerabilities, again, Lucy mentioned Move It, um, Move IT, sorry, I shouldn't say Move It. Um, it's obviously been on everyone's mind for, for several uh, weeks now, but we thought 2023 is actually seen quite a lot more impactful exploitation of zero days in terms of uh, cyber crime at the end of them. And the other thing I wanted to point out is actually the, when there is a patched vulnerability, um, the speed in which uh, proof of concept exploit codes are getting released afterwards, especially for the, um, the software and technology that we're concerned about within the financial sector is increasing. We do an analysis of, of the ones that we think are really important. And I think in June, it was down to an average of two days between a vulnerability being patched on one of the critical vulnerabilities to an exploitation code. Uh, uh, proof of concept code being out there. So it's going down, it's getting quick, and it's just showing just how much uh, vulnerabilities are impacting all of our threat landscapes. Um, very quickly, one other one on the cyber side to mention is the ransomware extortion groups. Uh, really important on how that's changing. And it's been changing over the last couple of years because of the amount of data that was in the source code leaks of some of those major ransomware groups. So uh, Reval, Conti, um, great versus defenders to try and get an idea of what they're actually doing with ransomware, but also really good for all of the um, people who would like to get into it to have a, a good starting point. I think it was recorded future last year, termed the, the, the phrase um, frank and ransomware. So they're talking about new ransomware strains all being based on uh, the old ones. And I think they found something like 150 different ransomware strains just in 2022 alone that would be in, uh, based on things like Conti and Reval, so massively issue, massive issue there. And I'll point quickly to the, the, the right-hand side, mobile malware, because we are in a, um, obviously, uh, that's the environment we're looking at at the moment, but it's an emerging threat. It's probably actually an established threat now. Um, I think the problem that we have is identifying when um, a, a fraud is not a first party fraud, it's actually something to do with mobile malware. You know, this, the, the, phone, the, the mobiles are getting, um, remote access tools on them and people are thinking from the fraud departments that, that it's actually just a first party fraud when it's, when it's the result of malware instead. So major issue on the, on the cyber crime threat landscape. Um, I'm going to leave it there because I know we're really pushing there but some other bits on there as well. Thanks. Just going to move over to the next bit here. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, everyone. Um, hopefully, that's given you a, a flavour of what each of the different areas are doing. But also, it gives you that um, viewpoint in terms of the similarities as well as some of the differences. Um, and we're just going to explore a couple of questions. Um, in the 20 minutes that we've got left. Um, so yeah, the first thing we're gonna do is really discuss the importance and benefits of being part of an ISAC or other trusted sharing group and how this builds a stronger security stance against cyber threats and risks. I know we've sort of covered this, but in terms of having this discussion as a panel, I think it's, um, we'll move into some new areas. Um, so I'm going to start with Link, because you're here. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, if you want to look yeah, into that. Um, I think there's sort of three areas that I want to point out on the, on the benefits of the sharing groups. Um, and I think it's mainly because we'd be, it's impossible to do these things by ourselves. So for me, it is limited resources. Um, working on this, it's expertise, and it's uh, having different parts of the puzzle each. So limited resources, there's only so much, even the most established, <laughs> 
threat intelligence SOC team can be dealing with in terms of uh, cyber threats because there's so many out there, you can't be over every single threat all of the time. Um, with being in the sharing community, as we've already mentioned in some of the, the initial talks, was it's a way to get um, your, your group to look at something and to understand when something is becoming more of a priority uh, together. More heads are always better than one. Um, but by working together as well, we all come with different expertise and different knowledge, different experience from different uh, sector areas. And I think that's really important because you have to be, get a rounded uh, result of any picture of anything that's coming out and actually we all have different parts of the same puzzle. We've all um, probably in different phases, if we think about submission for example, um, we've got different areas where a campaign may hit your infrastructure or may impact you more or less. So we all have parts that can come together to get a more holistic view on how we're better to prevent and detect and mitigate this sort of uh, threat. That's great. Thanks, Lynn. Hannah? Yeah, so I think from, uh, from the BT's perspective anyway, being part of the different ISACs is really useful across the telco industry to get that view on sector-specific threats, of course. Um, and like I mentioned as well, being the conduit to other sectors as well. I think, um, you know, being able to not work as competitors, being able to work as you know we're all part of the same security space be able to sh you know to share that timely intelligence related to a specific attack vector or a threat um, actor for example is is you know key to stopping a specific threat across you know uh, across all of the sector you know when it's, it's a threat actors don't come at a company just in a, you know in a uh, necessarily a very targeted attack it would be will try a breadth of companies you know, across the same sector because there'll be an in somewhere. So if we can share all of the information and relevant intelligence in a timely fashion, as a, as a collective, we can get on top of that threat. Great, thanks. Uh, for the railway sector, I would say more to be able to work in a more efficient way. So that means that, as I um, said earlier, we don't have the same level of maturity regarding cybersecurity. So it's good to be part of a group with some people that could take the leads and show us the way to a better way of tackling things regarding cybersecurity. So that's one thing we like to do. We, I heard this morning that there were too many information sharing group, but actually, okay, we, we, we don't have to take those for granted. So starting such a group is quite difficult. It takes energy. Uh, people don't, I mean, don't easily come by and want to join that group. So you really have to chase them to, 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 get, in, to get on board, actually. Um, so it helps us to work in a better, efficient way, really efficient way in the sense that we share the same infrastructure, the same problem. We don't have many resources, many experts. So it's a way of sort of gaining experience without, with um, hearing from other people talking uh, other mistakes and other incidents that they have to tackle. So we learn a lot from each other. So that's more, more or less what I have. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, I think it's important to, you say that you're uh, less mature, but actually there are things that you know about that we don't know about. And um, I think it's also important to see that it's when you're looking cross sector, and, and looking to maybe collaborate cross-sector in this way, we need to think about how we actually lift the other ISACs that maybe um, are less mature. It's not just about throwing money, it's about throwing um, best practice expertise. Um, and one of the things that um, I thought about in terms of the duplication of effort, so are we all looking at the same threat actor? Do we have reports? Do we have technical analysis reports, for example, that we could potentially share across sector or, or collaborate on these reports for the greater good? So, um, you know, I, I think every, every ISAC and sharing community starts somewhere. Um, and as I say, you're, you know, a very unusual in terms of, you know, potentially your threat landscape, but then there are lots of things that we've seen, um, you know, connectors. So, um, yeah. Sure for the moment, we are still focusing on ourselves, on the, rail, the railway sector itself. 
So we are not very sharing, you know, across that um, Isaac, but every time I come to such, you know, meetings, every time I go and deliver some speeches, it's, I always take some, you know, some takeaway. I always bring some things back to my, to my Isaac, to our Isaac, actually. For instance, I was talking about the, the Caesar Forum that we, 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 we started, um, we, we, we built that uh, last year. It's something that I learned from Ethic, for instance, because I, I heard them talking and I saw the organization, I said, mm, maybe we should take that one also, yeah. because it would, be, it would help us, and it does help us. So it's not that we are actively sharing information from the moment we are more taking in that we are you know, giving to people, but I suppose at some stage we'll get that far and we'll be able to also share information with other Isaac. Sure. Mm -hmm. And Lucy, I'm just going to tag on another question to that, um, just in terms of if you've got any use cases um, yeah, to provide. Absolutely. I mean, the benefits of being an I, in, a, in an Isaac or um, a community of sharing means that you've got that access to timely, relevant discussion, threat intelligence sharing that's sort of recent, that is being observed within the membership as well. And I think sort of some really good examples of that, it could be that whichever Isaac you're part of or want to be part of, they might have a really active and good public-private partnerships. So it may well be that your organisation doesn't necessarily want to speak with a particular financial SIR or NCSC, and your Isaac can actually be that conduit. And vice versa, if they do have their public-private partnerships working with local Isaacs or NCSCs, it means that the NCSC can also say, Do your mem has your membership seen any recent uh, indicators of compromise or a new method observed by a threat actor? And if so, will they share that with us? And we've seen that work really well at FS Isaac. And that's just a really easy way for us to sort of put back into the community, but also share in the local government as well. And I think sort of... Um, a good example, Leone, and I think you sort of might remember this was when there was a particular piece of um, malware that was targeting banking apps on mobile phones. It was a concern for our members, although they hadn't actually observed any activity, but they wanted to have like a technical analysis report on it. And it's really fantastic for us to be able to say, Leone, this <laughs> is a concern for our members. Is it a concern for yours? And do you have any recent IOCs or TTPs, which is the method? And we had that fantastic bit of sharing where we could then do the analysis, but then feed it back to your membership. And that then just shows sort of really good value of being part of the community. Another more recent, if I've got time, uh, example, <laughs> I mentioned earlier about the hacktivists. It may well be that your organisation um, it's not a concern whichever particular piece of activity is being threatened or is in the news. But if you can sanity check that with, within a community and just say, actually, have you seen any activity relating to these threats? Because it might be a concern for us. And it may well be, yes, we have. Be concerned. Ring your DDoS mitigation provider. But also it might be, no, they're just threats. It, 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 calm down. Let's just assess this. And you can build that information into your own internal assessment. And I think that's really sort of a useful part of being in an ISAC or community of sharing. Great. OK, in the interest of time, um, um, we did have some more use cases. Um, most of these guys are going to be around for uh, five, ten minutes afterwards. So if you want to ask more questions, I think um, that should be OK. I didn't actually check that. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but we will, um, I think it's important to know if we're not representing your sector, get in touch with me and um, we are building networks across, as you know, and I'll be able to find one for you, hopefully, um, that does cover. Um, so I guess we're going to move on to the elephant in the room and this is the challenges of sharing. Um, it's really difficult. Uh, there's lots of reasons why companies, um, sectors, regions, um, bosses, all, all sorts of different players um, have concerns about sharing. Um, you know, we've got geopolitical considerations. It's all about trust, really, and how we build that in. Maybe tooling's an issue for some, resourcing, um, the fact that 
you've got a global membership, so does that cause issues in terms of different countries that are being represented? Um, so yeah, we'll have a, a quick chat on that, um, and I'll start with um, Hannah first. Yeah, okay, so um, one of the, aside from, I guess, getting the, uh, the buy-in sometimes from a senior perspective, so whether that is the, like I mentioned previously, like the commercial aspect of sharing, and if you're um, share, potentially sharing information that you know could be used by your competitors to gain an advantage, for example. So that's one element of it. But another part as well, as as the only just mentioned, is the geopolitical element. Um, and within an ISAC, especially some of the larger ones, obviously have a, a wide global remit, and it's it's looking at the the ramifications of sharing intelligence with partners, um, obviously who, due to the current maybe geopolitical challenges, who might use that information in a way that you wouldn't want them to, um, where we've got national security concerns, so for example from a telco perspective where the UK telcos are now coming under um, tel Telecom Security Act regulations and therefore certain information can't be shared outside of, of the UK for example. Um, and also where we're sharing with um, international law enforcement as well with um, countries that might have sort of less than reputable kind of human rights um, uh, sort of laws and regulations around, for example, takedown of threat infrastructure. That's kind of a lot of the elements we have for consideration on whether we share a piece of intelligence or not, um, and obviously vice versa. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so there's a number of different challenges to work through. Okay, Lynn? Uh, yeah, um I guess the big thing is the well, two big things. I think one is building trust, uh, making sure that you are um, working in a way to try and make sure that people are happy with how they're sharing. So using what we've got in place with the traffic light protocols, uh, making sure that you've got that when someone puts something down as a TLP red, i.e., doesn't go any further, that's what happens. Um, you've got to keep these small steps to carry on with building the trust. Um, I think another thing is really working out what people want from the share. Um, if people aren't aware of what you are going to do with it, or if you don't act the way that they expect you to be acting on their intelligence, then will that encourage them to come back again uh, to share more later? Probably not. You've got to make sure you're not that intelligence hole where nothing comes back at the end. Um, so I think the trust aspect is, there's a lot of different steps to do that. It's easier in a small community, I think. Personally, we've only got the 13 members, so we've got a lot of very uh, close-knit um, discussions already. So I think that we've, we're one step ahead a little bit from the large Isaacs just because of that, because you've got the one-to-one. -one, you can really see who it is, who, who you're dealing with. But there's so many different ways to um, try and work through that. Um, but the other thing, I think, is the change in mindset. Um, making sure that you're not trying to do this whole intel sharing for the first time the first time you have your major incident. So if you've got an instant playbook and your something horrific's happened, a ransomware's happened, something's really got your whole SOC team and everyone else uh, in a real um, stress about it, you don't want to be then being saying, well, how are we going to share? Make sure you've already had those conversations with your legal teams to make sure how you're happy with knowing how much they would like you to share first. Because sharing out things like if it's a ransomware instance, sharing out those TTPs and methodology that's being used, the indicators as quick as possible really will help the rest of the sharing community and you'll get it back yourself eventually when it happens somewhere else and you're the one who's taken the information instead. And actually, ISACs have a, a part to play in that and I know that there are some ISACs that actually do regular tabletop exercising dependent on their maturity level and um, I believe, I think financial services ISAC definitely do and it's, it's definitely something we want to do when we grow up a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I just want to give that opportunity to you, Catherine, as well, if you've got anything to add. Uh, regarding the challenges, you mean? Yeah, yes, the yeah. challenges <laughs> with sharing. Well, um, as I expressed earlier, we, we, have, we are from the public sector, so um, what is actually at stake we, within the health sector is um, incident that leads to safety problems. And for the moment, we don't have any incident, well, I have no example in my, in my head, of a cyber incident that leads to casualties or to death. So that means there is no incentive to, do, to, to share information regarding that. 
um, we also have a big challenge regarding national legislation. So although we have got NIST regulation that actually asks us politely to share information between you know, um, members and country members, we don't do that very, um, very easily. So we always try to, you know, the only way to avoid that is just to talk to people directly in a very informal way. Because actually sharing information always happens between people. So building that trust is always between human beings. So that means that there is a lot of um, sort of face-to-face -face contact. You need to, to know each other, to trust each other. So it's more that way that you sort of try, yeah, you can go forward. Um, you can have all the law you want to if you don't have the people who are sort of prepared to meet each other face to face and share information, it's not gonna happen. Uh, so that's something that we've seen and I mean, trust is you know, between people and there is also something that we see in cybersecurity is that people come and leave. So every time you have to start again and again and again because you have to get each other, uh, I mean, to know each other. So it's complicated. Yeah, that's, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are moving. Um, within organizations, out of organizations, and it's trying to keep up with that and then build those relationships back in. Lucy, anything to add? No, I think the, the, just a, a quickly, I know we've seen sort of members struggle internally with their legal departments in sharing, and what we found really useful uh, is to have members who sort of share with us sort of really well, um, sort of demonstrate and, and explain how they've overcome obstacles to sharing, and that's been really valuable. Okay, that's great. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to make sure people had the, the contact details on the screen. Um, yeah, I, I think another thing we haven't covered is tooling, and um, there was a panel discussion this morning in terms of um, too many places to share, and I think it is, it is something of a challenge because, as I said in, in my presentation, we've got fraud and we've got cyber um, security experts and their needs and wants and the way that they present information and want to input information are very different. Um, so we've got to try and, and work through this really in terms of the tooling side. Um, but ultimately, I guess an ISAC can bring together information from all of these different areas within the community. So if you haven't got access to a chat forum or you haven't got access to the, the threat intelligence platform as um, the financial services ISAC um, Lucy demonstrated, you know, there's different reporting ways of and different ways of getting that information out there so that you kind of cover this um, for all your members. And I, I guess we need to sort of look at that in terms of the cross sector and the verticals. And, and that's our first step really with this sort of um, panel session that we've provided for you. I'm really sorry we haven't got time for questions, but again, you've got um, details up there for each of the different areas. And please do contact the TISAC at gsma.com for any questions you have on any other sectors. Um, or just any follow-up questions that I can feed to others. But thank you, and thank you to all my panel. <laughs>